like the traffic lights and all that stuff. So like this. Okay, you're gonna get to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um so before before I get to that, I just want to talk real quickly. So when I look at IoT or the Internet of Things, this is much different from the traditional network devices or the, the human interface devices, right? If I look at a laptop or a tablet, they have lots of memory, they have lots of processing power, they have they have relatively speaking lots of battery, lots of capacity. If I look at IoT type things, they don't. It's the opposite. We're back to tiny amounts of memory, tiny amounts of storage, tiny amounts of power, unreliable, um, only you know, only on every once in a while. So it's a totally different device type. So in order to make this type of device work, we have some much different requirements. So the, the most important thing is it must be very, very low power, right? Because we're looking at deploying these things in the field. We want them to last for years, so that battery's got to last a long time. It has to support a lossy or basically an unreliable network. You cannot assume the network's going to be reliable or that it's going to be on all the time. And it has to be simple. It cannot be a complex device. Um, all the rollouts that people have done with, with these kinds of networks where they've had gateways, all the companies have said the same thing. It doesn't work. It, it's got to be end to end. It's just because in terms of com complexity, scale, supporting, upgrades, <coughs> maintenance, it just doesn't work. So, um, what's interesting is, if you look at IPv4, it completely does not work, right? NAT is, NAT is very chatty, takes a lot of battery power. Um, I, traditional TCP IP does horrible with lossy networks. It's not designed for that at all, and it's very complex. So, if you look in this space, nobody is seriously looking at IPv4. It's off the table. Mm -hmm. So, now IPv6 is not that great either, but there's a special type of IPv6 called 6 low pan, or now it's being called 6 low for short, and this is basically designed to meet these constraints. So there's a whole part of the IETF and the IEEE that are focused on supporting these low power lossy networks. And these are where all the standards are converging. And so, with 6 low pan, we can meet this low power and lossy network setup, and IPv6 has built-in auto configuration, so that allows us to support this. So, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to point it out. To, to the best of my knowledge, and I would love for somebody to, to give me a counterpoint on this, but to the best of my knowledge, all the standards bodies, all the major companies, all the major you know, companies and vendors, all the major analyst firms, all the universities, everybody is in universal agreement that IPv6 and 6 will pan of the future. I, I can't find any counterpoints. So if, if you can find a counterpoint, I'd actually be curious to hear it. But as far as I can see, and it's kind of funny because you don't, you don't, you have to look for this. It's not the headline, it's kind of buried in the article. But if you look at all of these areas, they're all converged on the same thing. All right, so um, in terms in terms of practical examples of okay, how are people using this stuff? Um, so one concrete example I can give you is energy, is a smart grid. So I can tell you that one of the major, I'm not sure about both, but one of the providers in Michigan, their, their entire metering infrastructure is IPv6 only, right? And it, it's based on this 6 low pan technology. So um, that's, that's widely deployed all over the U.S. Building automation is coming. I know a lot of people that are looking at that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Transportation. So this was front and center at the Consumer Electronics Show. There were several de uh, demonstrations <coughs> of autonomous vehicles. So I think somebody tr had an autonomous vehicle go from LA to Vegas. Um, I can tell you that Ford is working with U of M right now, and there's all kinds of autonomous vehicles driving around in Arbor. And Google says that by 2017, they will have products on the street. Hmm. That might be a little optimistic. More conservative elements will tell you 2020. So you like they're offering something uh, 2016. Oh, there you go. So, so then maybe we will hit it. So, but autonomous vehicles are very real, right? There, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, in order for this to work, for these connected vehicles to work, you you have to have all kinds of communications capabilities, and all of this is pushing towards IPv6 just because of the scale. Um, there's a whole bunch more examples. I don't want to go through all of them. Uh, let me, let me talk a little bit about the Consumer Electronics Show. So um, one thing I can tell you with IoT is it's definitely still an emerging area. 
So it's not, it's not mature. So it was very interesting to watch CES this year because IoT is everywhere. I mean, everybody is, is a buzz with it. But in terms of, if, if you look, what they're going to say is, yeah, everything's getting a sensor, an actuator, a microcontroller. Everything's going to have the option to get online and do data. But we don't, we don't quite have it fully baked. Right? So I want to be candid. This is not here today. Right? Everybody's focused on this. It's coming, but it's still emerging. Right? So, you know, and, and this is the tough part. When is it going to be mainstream? You know, probably a couple of years, but I don't know. I, I, I can't give an exact time. It's something that you need to watch. Um, wearables, especially in healthcare, um, there, there was a lot of stuff at CES. Um, Self-driving cars, robots, drones, a lot of this stuff on the grid works automatically, no human intervention. So that, that all requires massive address base. All right. Um, these are just some more examples. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to go through too many of these. Detroit. 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 So there's, there, there's lots of stuff. So connected vehicles is probably the one you hear the most about. Um, one other thing I'll mention here are the smart buildings. So I think, if I remember correctly, 40% uh, of the grid, of our national electric, electric grid, is used for, to power buildings. It's a, it's a huge amount. And basically, if you look at businesses too, a huge percentage of the budget is basically pumped into maintaining buildings. Just HVAC, lighting, basic stuff. And it's all totally inefficient. So if, if you look, um, like I, I read a report by Gartner, they were talking about this. If, if you look at doing some kind of facilities energy management system, 40% um, is not that hard. So I mean, it's a significant amount of money. Again, this is typically something outside of IT, so something you have to look for. But I can also tell you that a lot of companies that I'm working with are, are, are pretty far down this road. So that's another thing. Um, and then, well, oh, oh, stop there. All right, so one, one thing I want to point out is, and this is a bit of a disconnect, typically when you talk about networking, IP, IPv6, stuff like that, you're, you're typically talking to IT people, right? Those are, those are, and that's who's usually governing that, and that, that's where I work too. However, if you look at all the people that are working in IoT, they're all outside of IT. So it kind of creates an interesting situation, right? Like, for example, um, when I'm working at companies and they're looking at facilities management, IT has no idea. And, and then, like, I actually introduce the two and they'll be like, oh, yeah, this needs IPv6, that's not a problem, right? And they almost fall over. So th there's typically no communication between the groups. Um, consumers, I'm, I'm going to leave out, but the other one is uh, engineering. So a lot of, if you look, for example, automotive sector, right? So you have all this stuff going on with connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, advanced driver assistance systems, all these new technologies. A lot of this stuff requires advanced networking. But again, these are really smart people. They're doing stuff on their own. So not, not necessarily working with IT. So that kind of creates an interesting situation where um, IT is basically will say, you know, nobody's asking for it, so we don't need it. All right, so I don't, I don't know if you've seen this one. Um, and I mean, I'm, you know, I'm guilty of this too. So, um, and if, if you ask IT, this is what they're gonna pair it back. And I, I, this, this is everybody. I think any, I don't think anybody would disagree with this, right? I'm not gonna play IPv6 because there's no value and nobody's asking for it, I don't want it. Now, if, if you read all the analyst reports that will say, this is a low value thing. There's always a little asterisk that says, unless you're doing IoT. But nobody, nobody, again, you have to look for it, right? It's the fine print. All right, so, so you have all these different groups, facilities, engineering, operations, that are, that are looking at these new technologies that are leveraging this. Um, but here's the problem. If I'm, if I'm a plant manager, do I care about TCP IP or IPv6? I don't care about that, right? I care about are my cars making it off the line into the showroom, right? As far as the details, you know, whatever. So it, it creates an interesting situation because the people that are using these technologies are generally not networking people. They don't care about it. And so 
they don't even think to ask it. You know, I want all this new stuff. I don't care what it runs. I just care that it works. But because they don't realize that there's that underlying need, then we have a bit of a problem. So we have groups that want to deploy these technologies. The group that supports the network, though, doesn't hear an explicit call out for it and thinks it's not needed. All right, so um, I, went, I went back in history because I, I always heard this, that um, you know, we've always had TCP, TCF, TCP, IP forever and never anything else. Uh, I didn't think that was true, but I actually went and checked. So the internet actually, when it was created, it ran something called NCP, which was a totally different protocol. And TCP, IP came along later. And I always heard this thing about there's no flag day for IPv6. I was curious about that. That actually came from NCP. So DCA, which is now DISA, which is basically the part of the DOD, they basically said that, okay, for our applications, we like TCP, we're gonna switch to that. They really didn't care about the network part, they just thought it was better for their applications, that, that was what drove it. And so they decided, okay, we're not gonna do multi-protocol, we're just gonna do TCP IP, so everybody in the internet has to switch. And you have until <coughs> January 1983 and we're turning NCP off, and that's it. And that's how, the, that's how it got transitioned. <laughs> But one thing I found that was interesting is, if you actually look back at the history of this, even though there were a whole bunch of limitations with NCP, and everybody agreed that it was a logical progression to move to TCP IP because it had a, you know, it's basically better, more, more functional, the users did not want to do it. They were totally against it, they were irritated, you know, why are you making this change, this isn't a priority, and basically only because the DCA forced it is why it happened. So, um, today though, that's, that's not going to work, right, because the Internet's distributed. So um, one thing for me is in the past year, I, I've, I've changed a little bit from my focus is more on architecture and less on engineering. And so as part of that, I have to deal more with kind of processes and looking out into the future than I did before. And so um, I've been reading this blog by Simon Wardley, um, great guy. He talks, his, his focus is on IT strategy. That's all he talks about. He's not interested in, or he's not into the technical stuff. It's, he's a pure strategist. And he talks about how things evolve. So one thing that, that I found kind of interesting is when he talked about cloud computing, he basically went back to the electric grid. And I guess a long time ago, before we had a national electric grid, companies would actually generate their own electricity. And it took a long time before people were finally like, okay, I trust the grid. I'm going to plug into the grid and I'm not going to have my own generator. And, and he basically compares that to cloud computing. He says we're undergoing a similar transfer. You know, in, in his opinion, we're undergoing a similar transformation. And what he talks about is as things evolve from somebody creates this, this new idea and then it evolves into something that's custom built and then pretty soon it's a standardized product, people rent it, and then eventually it becomes a utility service. So he says that things tend to evolve. And what happens is, as things evolve, the people that created all these products, and compute is a perfect example of this. If we look at all the traditional compute companies, they create all these great products, they have everything set up, they're making a lot of money, and they, they have been fighting cloud tooth and nail, right? So what's hilarious is, People have seen this coming for, I think a guy wrote a book about cloud computing in 1966, he pointed <laughs> out, right? So it's been known for a long time this is going to happen, and who's the person that basically came in and capitalized on cloud computing? An online book reseller, right? Who, I mean, who, how, can you believe that? An online book, a small online book reseller has basically cornered the market. And all the, all the bohemists are quaking in their boots that they can catch up. And some people think they can't, right? So what he, what basically what he says in this blog is, when the companies create their products, they get comfortable. You know, I'm making a lot of money, I have a whole ecosystem, I don't want to change, right? So what he says is an outsider has to come in that has no investment in the current products, right? Somebody like Amazon and say, you know what, I don't care about the status quo, you know, I'm moving to the utility model. And uh, I, I think this is kind of where we're at with IPv6 today. We're, we're, we're stuck in this space right here because we're all comfortable with TCP IP 
It's everywhere, it's in all our products, it's in our code. I mean, even if you think about accessing something on your network or at home, do you think of the DNS address or do you know all the IPv4 addresses by heart? Or how many, how many programmers still hard code IPv4 addresses, right? I'm guilty of it too because we know it, mm -hmm. right? It's so ingrained. And so the hard thing is, how do we get past this inertia barrier? Because as you can see, if, if we look at where we're going, in, in terms of stuff on the network, right? This, I mean, you know, the timing might be a little off, mm -hmm. but I mean, if we're going to 100 trillion devices on the internet, I mean, there is no way that can work with IBD4. I mean, there's just no way. And this is not that far off. So, so this is the hard thing, is making, is making that jump. All right, so all right, so I'm just going to make this confession right now, right? So th this is usually the most popular question I get is, you know, when we're looking at deploying IPv6, when when do I really need it? So that said, now that we've gone through this, can anybody see with with waiting until somebody actually? What about the plan? Let's say nobody's asking me for IPv6. Right? Now, if I'm a small company, I, I can probably get away with that. But if I'm a sizable company, right? like if I'm a Fortune 1000 company, what's the risk if I don't do anything until somebody comes and asks me? How long is it going to take me to roll it out? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Right? So, that's, so th this is a little tough, right? because you can see it coming, but the problem is nobody can really tell you when. You know, I wish I could say, by 2017, you have to have it rolled out. But I, what I can do is I can give you some data points, right? And I, I'd actually be very interested in some candid feedback on this because I would, anything I can give people to make it clear or, or to, to help you see what's coming, I'm, I'm interested in. So these are, there's lots of common questions. You have a question? Yeah, uh, talking about manufacturing plant or sure. that thing, ProfiNet, uh, how, does, how does all this impact? So what's, um, excellent question, what, what's changing in terms of all the old proprietary standards is those are all going to be swept away and replaced by TCP IP, right? So if, if you look at, you know, like Bosch and Honeywell and GE and all the people that deal with your traditional controls type networking and automation, that's slowly evolving to TCP IP. Now, in, in terms of you know, where exactly the rat and how fast it's going to happen, it, it depends on the manufacturer. I mean, you know, my off-the-cuff assessment of manufacturing stuff is, I, I think it's still a few years out. We've got a lot of timing concerns and, and uh, durability concerns as well. You can yeah. These older networks, so. Yeah. Yeah, because, right, when, when I, when I uh, you know, if I pay, you know, for example, I think, uh, my wife is from Windsor, so she told me that uh, Chrysler is putting two billion dollars to renovate one of their plants. Right. So if, if you're pumping two billion dollars for one plant, that better last for a long time. So I, I can definitely appreciate that. If, if I'm going to spend all the money on the line and the new equipment, I got to have confidence that that's going to last for decades. So it's 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 evolving. Um, yeah, and it's, it's the manufacturers, and, and when I was designing plants, uh, they were, you know, they had their own network. Yeah. Those guys. And yeah, my bus and all those, all, all proprietary. So. Yeah, so that basically all the proprietary stuff is fading away for, for the same reason that TCP IP took over the internet. Because if I can get away from all that proprietary stuff and move everything to TCP IP, then it, it just makes it easy to standardize and make, and make things more modular. So so there's, that's, that's gradually happening, but you know, from, from my research, um, I, I think that's still a couple of years out. I, I, think, I think what we're going to see first is the facilities energy management because that's a no-brainer, right? If, if I can save even 10% for any sizable company, if I can save even 10% of my power costs or my HVAC costs, I miss a no-brainer. I can, I can pay for it really fast. So we're going to see a lot of that and we're going to see a lot of um, 
connected and autonomous vehicles, drones, robots, stuff like that. That, that. That's what's ready for prime time. From a facilities perspective, what I, what I saw in the industry was um, they're moving towards service-oriented models where there's a, a company that they say we're going to pay uh, X number of dollars and if you can save, you know, you manage the whole thing. So they're bringing in all their equipment and the whole, so it's service-oriented. Companies that are providing facilities, man, uh, facilities energy management as a uh, yeah, service. Sure. Yeah, sure. So yeah, absolutely. If we can outsource it, why do it ourselves? So they would naturally ride on top of whatever network was in place. So I, I think that um, so so cloud cloud has been a little slow with IPv6, but I did see something from the Red Hat VP in charge of their OpenStack unit that he thinks this year it's going to take off. Because if, if I'm a cloud, let's look at the cellular industry, right? because that's what I know really well. If I look at um, AT&T and Sprint, and I, I don't know this from being an employee, I just know this from outside knowledge, but uh, if I look at how their cellular networks work, I have all these overlapping pockets, and I have this super elaborate system to manage it. Now, if I control the entire infrastructure like a cell company does, I can get away with that. But if I'm a cloud provider and I have thousands of customers and each one of those customers is going to have overlapping address space, I mean, it just doesn't scale. That's, that's going to kill my cost model. And so the, the more we move to outsourcing stuff and the more we move things into the cloud, we have to move to an addressing system where everybody can be unique just, just because otherwise it kills me on management. Because the, the management costs to, over, to manage all the overlapping address spaces are, are really prohibitive. Like, I don't know if you had to deal with ANX at all. Uh, if you look at the automotive stuff with trying to make that work, it, it's a nightmare. To, just within the plants, they... they um, but even, even within the plant, right? So I, I have to have some kind of a network path into that plant. But then if, for that back-end provider, right, he's got all the various customers. If, if all those customers have overlapping address space, it makes it a nightmare for him to manage it. Yeah, obviously, but they're providing a service so that there are different types of savings coming on and they have the expertise in managing all the devices so they're getting them connected to devices however the devices are, are sitting in the plant. Yeah, they I mean, don't have control. To, I mean, to a point you don't care, but, right, at the end of the day, for them to stay in business, they have to charge you cost plus, right? So, so the more you can help lower their costs, the more you can create a, a market, a uh, market type establishment where you have competition between different providers, then you can lower the cost overall. But that uh, obviously it's just the different business models that are. That are we should, in. We should probably get that. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, well, I could talk about a lot of stuff. I have a lot of questions. So, my first question really has to do with. Um, so you're going to have these devices that move around, right? It is. IPv6 capable of handling mobility like that? Devices moving from one subnet to another, one connection point to another? Um, it, so there, there, is, there is a mobile IPv6, but outside of the cellular industry, nobody uses it. So um, maybe someday, but that's not something that's currently in any host operating system. And I can tell you that Linux, Microsoft, and Apple have no interest in it. So I don't expect that to change in the near future, unfortunately. So from a host perspective, no. From a network perspective, there are some solutions, but but they're they're pretty complex, and that's kind of a whole topic. So I not a great answer. Does that? That's kind of the answer I would expect. Okay. There's a bug. I get the impression that IPv6 gives every each and every device a unique address. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, so so here's here's where mobility is interesting, right? So um, if cell phones aren't a good example because it's built in. If I if I take my laptop, right, and let's say I have let's say I have an SSH connection. I mean, this is kind of overly technical example, but let's say I have an SSH connection to some kind of a system, and I'm running an application on it, right? So if I go from the wireless network to an LTE network and then plug into an Ethernet network, it certainly would be nice if my connection could just roam 
across all those connections and I wouldn't just have to keep disconnecting and reconnecting. So there is a lot of value in mobility, um, but like I said, the, the operating systems vendors are, are not interested in doing it. So th there are solutions, but not, not from an operating system perspective. Let me let me let me let me uh, let me let me table that one because that's it's a very interesting area, but that's a whole that's really a whole night's topic <laughs> talking about mobility. Next year's dinner. So um, what I wanted to show so when most when most people look at IPv6, they're kind of familiar with that Google page, but there's a problem with the Google page. When I look at the Google IPv6 statistics page, does anybody know what it's showing me? That's showing me global adoption. But really, do I really care about global adoption? I mean, there are billions of people that are never going to buy my products or services, right? So I, I, don't, I don't really care globally. I really care per market, right? So if I look just at the US, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is where we're at in the US. So at the beginning of 2013, we were at about six and a quarter percent penetration. And at the end of 2014, there tends to be a spike at the end of the year. It went up to like 14 and a half, but it's actually come back down to 13 and a half. But we doubled, right? So go, going back to these questions real quick, there, there, uh, there tend to be lots of questions, right? That there's, there's so many ways you can look at IPv6, but probably the most useful one that's on the next page is does it work end to end? So if I'm sitting in my house or I'm sitting on my cell phone or my tablet or I'm sitting at Starbucks, from my access device, can I go all the way to an IPv6 site or service? Right, because in order for me to do that, everything else has to work. And what this is showing is what percentage of users have that capability, right? What's my penetration? So right now, we're, we're at about 13 and a half to 14%. So that's not a ton, that seems pretty good. That's but, good. But, but yeah, it's probably more than a lot of people think, right? It's, it's not a few percentage points, it's significant. And if we look at the next three years, so this is curve fitting, right? So take it with a grain of salt, but it is based on data from the past three years. So this is Google's data going almost back to the beginning of 2012. And this is basically the blue line is how we've ramped up. Right, and if we do curve fitting, that's basically our projected adoption. And I, I think that's actually, I've, I've played with the data a bunch of different okay. ways. That's, this is a fairly accurate projection. So even in terms of ramp up, I mean, you know, that, that's three years out. So three years is a long period of time, but. How, how is this affecting the TCP applications? Since it, everything's running on TCP. Um, it, it's still mostly the same, but there are some differences. Because if, if, you, if you look at it from a, from a socket level, right. you have to do the pseudo header, right? So the pseudo header is going to be different for IPv6 than for IPv4. So there are some changes. So everybody's going to have to go and change over yeah. the TCP application. Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> so um, so I'll, I'll confess, it's I'm not a developer. So if I use Java, and I use like the generic socket call, I'm fine. Right, so if I use a more modern language and I use the abstractions, and I know that's also true in Windows, although I don't know what the exact calls are. If I use like a native socket call, like a low-level call, then yeah, then, then, then I'm talking code. I'm talking updated code, so it depends. But, but I, I will tell you, and I, I, uh, let me come back to that because I have a slide. Um, but, but it's a non-trivial effort. So uh, I just wanted to point this out in terms of critical mass, 10% is the minimum, 15% is moderate, conservatively you'd say 20%. So however you, however you define critical mass, if you define it on the more aggressive side, we're already there. Even if you define it conservatively, that's maybe six months off tops. So right, right now we have over 34 million users in the US that have IPv6 access. So from a product point of view, right, so one thing that I got a kick out of is um, I'm you know, working in companies, and like I said, typically IT has a negative reaction on IPv6, and I can appreciate that because they have too many things to do, right, and it's one more thing. But last couple of months, I'm sitting there and somebody's saying, nobody ever asked for this, it's a waste of time, blah, 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 blah. And an engineer walks in and says, we just bought a really expensive modeling application, 
and, it, and it's IPv6 only. And I want to deploy it tomorrow. And that's not a problem, right? And I had to try really hard not, not to laugh. But, right, that, that's, that's where it's going. I've also seen several instances of where people put stuff out for bid or for RFP, for cloud services, where somebody would come back, and these aren't small companies, these are some of the big vendors, and they'd say, yes, we have a great solution, we have a great price, but you have to connect to us using IT.